Hello, Smart Money Tree Podcast listeners. Welcome to this week's show. My name is Kirk Chisholm, and I'll be your host. So today, I'm joined with, again, my good friend, Doug Hagren. Hey, Doug. Hey, Kirk. Happy Friday once again. Back finally on schedule, because I know that uh, we've had to shift these a few times, and I think in the next week or two, we're going to shift it again. It's just cra- crazy times, but Friday, it's always a pleasure being with you on a Friday. Yeah, always always enjoyable. It uh, reminds me of that video. I don't know if you People keep sending me this video every Friday. This this guy gets out of the car and like, it's Friday. What? It's Friday? He starts dancing along the side of the car. It's like one of my favorite videos. Anyway. Um, all right. Well, let's just kind of dive right in here. And happy Halloween to anyone because we missed uh, we missed uh, telling everybody happy Halloween last time. And I don't have a costume here, so I feel out of, out of place. But anyway, um, I do want to say, though, my... My kids, any of you have kids and, and you're trying to teach them about personal finance, um, it's funny because my kids need to learn a little lesson. But uh, yesterday, I, I got a ring at the doorbell. Of course, my dogs are going nuts and it's like yell at my dogs and come to find out there's like two young girls. And I think they were, uh, where are they? They're in fifth and sixth grade. So they come by, they're like, we want to rake your leaves. And this was yesterday before the leaves were raked. So my yard was a mess and the cleaners came and they took them all away. Um, anyway, they, they leave me this note they, they, and, and it like, it says, we need, do you need your leaves raked uh, and, and bagged? Uh, these two young girls uh, will do it for you. We're young students, fifth, sixth grade. We live on this road. We'll save you money for, we're, we're looking to save money for the summer, $12 an hour. And we're available on these dates. Awesome. And I did this right in front of my boys. I'm like, this is great. I'm going to hire these girls and trying to trying to influence them. Like money's not easy. You know, my, my, my youngest son needs some money. He's like, I'm going to bag some leaves. And he bagged one set of leaves. He's like, all right, I'm done. Like, okay, whatever. We're not doing this again. So I'm actually going to pay these girls to come do this just so I can, A, I think it's a good deed because if somebody's an entrepreneur, you should support that. More people in this country should have that work ethic. I want to support that. I don't need them. I already pay somebody to take my leaves away. This is literally money I'm lighting on fire, uh, kind of like a pile of leaves. Uh, and, and I'm lighting on fire because I'm supporting two young girls who really want to work hard and save money and love that. I mean, we need more of that in this country. And I think we've gotten away from that because everything's so easy and comfortable. Um, and I think that's going to start to change. It has in the last few years, and it's going to start to change in this country. The 70s were not an easy time. Uh, the early 80s were not an easy time. A lot of people didn't have a lot. Um, and I think we're going to go back to that at some level. And I think people need to toughen up a little bit and get a little less comfortable. Uh, we'll talk about that on, on future shows. But I did want to say I, I thought it was brilliant. And uh, kudos to these two girls for doing that. And I'm, I'm a supporter. So let me dive right in because um, I was looking at a chart uh, last week. And I thought this is a great topic to bring up on the show this week. And... The topic is, the, 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 let me gonna share my screen here. Uh, the, the slide is titled, um, Yield from Cash Now Exceeds That of Stocks. And I'm gonna bring it up here. All right, so let's talk through this because I think this is gonna be instructive. Now, if you're comparing investments, you're looking at what is the best use of your money given risk and reward. So if I can put my money in the bank and it gets me 0% interest, which a lot of banks still pay that, 0% interest, or I can put my money in a treasury earning 5%, which one's better? Well, okay, let's analyze it. They both are uh, very low risk, right? Assuming the bank's FDIC insured, then the money is quote unquote guaranteed by the FDIC, um, which... There's no guarantee in a systematic failure, but it's a it's a uh, moral obligation of the government to support it. So it's basically okay. It's FDIC insured, but you're you're also not getting any return. Okay, that's not very good. Money's quote unquote guaranteed, but it's it's no return. U.S. Treasuries, well, U.S. Treasuries aren't guaranteed, but it's the closest thing we can find to a guarantee in our financial system is short-term Treasuries, and. They're earning 5%. Well, is that worth it? Heck yeah. I mean, for the in, unless the U.S. government's going to stop paying uh, and go bankrupt and default, then that's a really good investment, 5% for that. Okay, good. Well, what else is out there? 
okay, well, I can invest in real estate. Well, my real estate's not making me very much because I buy it and I can rent it out at one or 2%. And there's risk. There's risk of the price falling. There's a risk of not getting a renter. There's risk, right? Built in there, there's risk. If I'm getting 1%, it doesn't account for the risk. The risk might be 5% and I'm getting 1%. So all it takes is a bad year and I'm completely underwater. So not a good exchange off. I'll still, I'll still keep the treasuries over here. To me, that's still a winner compared to real estate. Okay, what else? Well, we can look at um, corporate bonds. Great. Let's look at corporate bonds. Depending on the credit rating, if it's a high credit rating, like a AAA, okay, well, that might be a good comparison because there's a low probability of them defaulting. It's not zero, right? We've had AAA companies default. AIG, for one, was AAA rated. I believe GE at one point was AAA rated. Also, uh, almost went in default in 2008 or almost went bankrupt in 2008 and were shadow bailed out by the government. Um, and you had AIG, which is AAA rated, which was very sound. And they just were doing a lot of shady stuff and got taken down. So it's not guaranteed, but depending on the company, some companies, when they're not financially related, tend to be a little bit more secure. So anyway, I'm not going to get on the path of rating agencies, but there's questions there. But point being is there's less risk there than there is at a triple B or even a B. Um, so you can look at that and say, all right, what am I getting on my, um, what am I getting my corporate bonds? Well, let's take a look. I'm going to bring that up right now. And let's look at the, sorry to bore the listeners with this as I was not prepared. Um, let me, okay. So we pull up the yield curve here for fixed income and we're looking at, um, come on, there we go. No whammies. Okay, so U.S. Treasuries are getting over 5% up to one year. Let's look at corporates. So AAA corporates, you're getting under 5%. So very similar to Treasuries. AA, similar to AAA. Single A, well, you're getting a little bit more. You're getting 5.7. Okay, that's interesting. Well, companies like IBM, I believe, are, are, are single A rated. So you've got some big companies that are probably stable enough to pay that for the next year. Okay, I can get an extra 50 base points. Is it worth it? I don't know. We'll have to go look. Um, they don't have high yields here, but looking at munis, munis, you can get AAA, you can get about 4%. Well, oh, that's pretty interesting. What's the tax equivalent yield in that? Oh, 6%. Well, that's interesting, right? AAA munis get a tax equivalent yield of approximately 6% one year out. That's really interesting. Is that worth it? I don't know. But is it worth looking into? Absolutely. Okay. So now I'm comparing 5% treasuries, which are close to good, you know, pretty much money good. Um, you have munis, AAA munis, which you could argue whether they're money good or not, depends on the state. But uh, there's, you know, if it's a GO or um, a really solid revenue bond, potentially you could, you could, you could have some good, good numbers there, but you have to research that. Um, anyway, so the, um, but now let's look at stocks. Okay, let's look at stocks since we got this chart up here. Well, basically what we're looking at here is that this is the uh, earnings yield of the S&P 500. So the aggregated of 500 stocks into one earnings yield. Um, now over the last 20 years, it's been positive, which means it's better to put your money in stocks than in cash based on the earnings yield, right? And I'm, I won't go down the rabbit hole of what that means, but just, just Take me for a word, earnings yield in comparison. So if you looked in the in, in the 50s and the 60s, it was better to put your money in stocks because the earnings yield was higher. But if you looked in like the early 70s, you looked in the early 80s and spikes through the 80s and uh, late 90s, it was you were much better off putting your money in three month treasuries because the earnings yield is higher. Now, what can you deduce from this? Well, let's look at it. Oh. It went negative in the early 70s. What happened in the 70s? Oh, there was a recession. What happened in 74? Oh, there was a recession. What happened in the early 80s? Oh, there was a recession. Like, you know, look at the uh, look at the late 90s into 2001. Oh, wow, I remember that. There was a recession there too. So the point is, is when you get, and this is the, this is the lesson I'm trying to convey today. It's not that this means there's a recession. What it means is when you get below zero, Right. So basically, when the earnings yield um, from cash is or, or when this ratio is negative, what it basically means is that it's more profitable to put money into bonds than there is into stocks. 
That's all this is saying is that when it's positive, it's better to put money in stocks in terms of risk to reward. When it's negative, it's better to put money into bonds. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't own stocks. I'm not saying you should only own bonds. What I'm saying is this is a metric you can use to analyze the whole market and say, wow, bonds are a good deal in comparison to stocks. Now, we started talking about this a year ago. We said, start looking at bonds. We're not quite there yet, but start looking because it's getting really attractive. And this, mostly this whole, most of this year, we've been saying the same thing. We've been pounding the table on bonds. Bonds are really attractive. 5% and up is an attractive yield in comparison to whatever else is out there today. Now, it's expensive today. Everything's expensive across the board. I've talked to many, many friends that work at hedge funds and other you know, large financial institutions, and they're all saying the same thing. I cannot find anything reasonably priced or attractive. So look at this and just d deduce, like, should I be in stocks? Maybe. Maybe you should. I don't know. I don't like stocks here because of this. And this is from the index perspective. This isn't individual stocks. Of course, there's great and terrible stocks out there. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm walking around with, with a net looking to pick up stocks and nothing's falling in it, right? Um, I would imagine maybe a year or two, we go into recession, we'll see a lot more deals. But right now, I'm happy getting five, five and a half percent on U.S. Treasuries just because of this, just this one thing. Right. And this doesn't take into account anything else. Right. This is just I'm looking at this and saying, I feel pretty good about my position because more and more, the more negative this goes, the more attractive that bonds look. And at some point that's going to change. You know, stocks fall 20, 30, 50, 60 percent. I'm going to change my mind. Right. So if we're a year from now and you, you listen to this and you're like, well, you said that bonds are more attractive. Like, well, first of all, that was a year ago. And second of all, I have a right to change my mind. And I'll talk about it in the show. I'm not keeping anything from anybody. I'm, I'm fully transparent in the show. If, if, I, if, if I feel like things are changing, I'm going to tell you. And just like we have in the show, we said bonds are changing. Not yet, but pay attention. And now we're banging the table on bonds. you got to pay attention. Now we're at a point where you say, all right, I'm still not paying attention to equities because there's nothing that's attractive in there yet. They have sold off from the peak depending on the index quite a bit. And you know, I know they bounced in the last two days, but um, in general, when you think about your portfolio, just because the market's down 10% from the peak doesn't mean it's attractive. It is still expensive and still wildly unattractive in comparison to anything else. So if you look at your frameworks, you know, we talk about in the show frameworks, you think about your frameworks, you think about your lens in the world, it is a stack of different lenses. This is a lens. Earnings yield comparison to cash, uh, earnings yield of the stocks compared to cash is a lens. If you're looking at the world with this lens, what does it tell you? It says bonds are a better deal than stocks right now. That's all it says. It doesn't say the world's going to blow up. It doesn't mean that we're going to recession. None of that. It just means that right now bonds are better than stocks. And you know what? The bond market is quite big in comparison to the stock market. What do you think is going to happen if everybody wakes up one day and says, hmm, my stocks aren't going anywhere, but I can get five and a half percent from bonds. And all of a sudden there's a big rush out that door. You know, it's like a, a, a fire. It's like a fire hose trying to go through a, a Dixie cup. Right. You've got this huge rush of people out of stocks into bonds. The bonds will be fine. Uh, stocks, not so much. Once people realize stocks are not really the best place to be at the moment, they're going to start changing their patterns. And we had a good 10 years of Tina, or there is no alternative to stocks, basically. And basically, bond investors are putting money into stocks because they can't make any money in bonds. So it, it caused the stock market to go to really high heights. So the better the bond market does, like, I'm sorry, the higher the yield of the bond market, the more likely people are going to invest. If you give me a 7.5% treasury, God, I, I I wouldn't only go all in. I'd probably double up. I mean, that'd be great in this environment. But I don't think we'll get there. I think five, five and a half percent is probably the peak of what we're going to get in this cycle. So just keep in mind, there are many lenses to look through. This is one of them. This is your lens for the week. Uh, cash versus stocks, earnings yield. Which one's better in comparison to the risk to reward?
I live in the great state of Massachusetts. I may be the only one who calls it that, but I digress. The great state of Massachusetts has a commercial funded by the state that says, you can't win the lottery if you don't play. For the moment, let's ignore the fact that there's a state-sponsored commercial suggesting that you go out and spend your hard-earned money gambling on lottery tickets with odds of over 100 million to one of winning. But it's true, you can't win if you don't play. I'm giving you the same opportunity here in the show. The only difference is I'm not asking you to buy a lottery ticket. I'm only asking five to 10 minutes of your time. But I will pay you at least 100 million Zim dollars for your time. We do have some foreign listeners. So if you don't like Zim dollars, we may have some other currencies as well. If you want to earn over 100 million Zim dollars, go to www.moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money to get your free money today. Doug, I know we got a lot of things to talk about today, but what's on your mind? Well, I want to just address one little, one more thing on that because we, 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 I agree completely. As a matter of fact, I think, I don't know if I've talked about it on this, but when I got my CFP certification, well, the gentleman that taught the last review course that I went through was a, was a gentleman that held a lot of designations, but he was also a bond trader in uh, uh, on Wall Street in the 1980s. And he happened to be one of a handful of bond traders that were uh, working in 1987 on Wall Street. And, uh, you know, you might, most people, you know, you might have heard of if you don't remember uh, what happened in 1987. Well, as he said then, that was my greatest day. Like, you know, because what happened as the stock market plummeted, people flew to bonds for safety. The other thing that I want, and, and what you just talked about there is again, it would not, it'll be good for bonds, it won't be good for stocks. The other thing that I want to point out here, which I think is also a very interesting tidbit, is a lot of people, and there has been probably more than ever in the last 10 years, a focus on uh, many people in the the, twi the Twitter world just invest in the S&P 500. Let's see, you know, because that's the place, best place to make money. And they'll quote 8, 10, 12% returns. Okay. Now, how many people do you know, Kirk, put all their money in just the S&P 500 that don't diversify, just buy 100% stocks. Probably very, not that common. Would you agree? Very few. Yeah, very, very few. few. So I want to get to give you a, so, some information. Now, if you if you have only lived in a vacuum since 2010, the S&P 500 total return, and let's say you went out and you bought a very low cost index fund. So let's just say it's like, you know, the cost is 0.1% um, and probably only had 70% of your money allocated to that stock to the to actual stocks you would have the actual return over that 10 years kirk a total return s p amazing i mean we know we all know it's like the only place you they, they could argue the only place you probably should have been in the last 10 years because the rate, rate of return average was 14.54 percent from 2010 to 2020 and the actual return was a little less than that 13.99 but if you only had you know 70 percent of your portfolio in equities you basically made about nine, you know, nine to ten percent, which is amazing. But let's go back ten years further. Ten years further, if we start at two thousand to twenty twenty, and you had that same spread, guess what? The average rate of return was eight point one nine percent. The actual was six point six one. But if you only had seventy percent of your money allocated to the S P five hundred, your actual rate of return over the last from two thousand to twenty twenty was three point two six percent. Let's talk about what cash is paying right now. Right, you can get in money markets four, five percent. So twenty years, people would have looked at their portfolios and said, "Wow, I've only made three to four percent net off of this with all that risk and volatility." I think right there says something. It says something about understanding averages versus actuals, and I also think it says a lot more than people want to recognize about how risk can completely change the return you've got. Twenty years of basically lost growth. And if we move into a situation like you just said, where you can get five to seven percent on cash without that volatility, now it explains why the bond market has been so volatile. Because if you can get five to seven percent on on cash, why would you take any risk in fixed income? If you can get five to seven percent on cash, why would you take any risk in the stock market? It, it, we are really coming back into, if we're not already there, a time in which it isn't just going to be one asset class is going to rule them all. And it isn't going to be a time, and it's going to be a time where, based on numbers like that, just expect to see a heightened level of volatility. And what the net result will be on those returns is yet to be seen. 
But if we look back over what happened when we came through those various cycles previously, it's definitely it definitely led to a situation which volatility got heightened, returns got suppressed. If I go back to 1990, the, the actual return was 6.21%. If I go back to 80, it's 7%. If I go back to 70, 658 What it's telling you is that consistently, other than the last 10 years that were fantastic, returns in this in the equity markets have been well below the eight percent to twelve percent that some people talk about and during the you know the last 20 years since 2000 they have definitely been significantly worse so guess what cash was you know if you look at you know if you look at cash what it was paying then certainly nothing you look at what it's paying now times change so do so does the need for strategies so yeah no that's that's, that's, I think it's a really important point and it's something that you don't hear a lot of people talking about it. And the only reason we talk about it is because we want to educate you and we want you guys to understand that there are many ways to look at the world. And if you're listening to the mainstream media, if you're, if you're listening to Wall Street, you're going to hear the same stuff over and over again. And it may not be that they're deliberately trying to pull the wool over your eyes, but I think there's a lot of people out here that just parrot what they've heard and they don't think. And I know this because my industry is taught uh, to parrot certain things because they've been true. Diversification is the best risk management tool. No, it's not. It is a, it's not even a risk management tool. It is a volatility management tool. And I think that, you know, in, in what I've discovered over my career would probably shock a lot of you, uh, maybe not Doug, but the, the rest, the rest of the listeners, um, some of the things I've discovered are just crazy. You know, if you, if you think about like diversification, when it came out, like it was basically an academic model that somebody came up with. I won't get into the details because I don't want to botch the details, but I, I have them written out. But basically, the guy who came up with diversification, great model. Like it's, it was an economic model, came up with it. Somebody on Wall Street figured out that this that this can be used to sell more mutual funds. So it wasn't it, it wasn't a truism it was an economic model and if you know anything about models models aren't true they're just approximate right the model is designed to approximate what's going on are they 100 percent true absolutely not but wall street really loves to take models and assume they're true kind of like 2008 real estate always goes up remember that one um and so you know if you think about models right they're used to design to, to illustrate a point and you know, there's models on, on global warming or climate change or whatever you want to call it these days. Those are based on, on models. The reason they're based on models is because you can't actually put together the data uh, in such a way that you can analyze it, right? So most things are based on models, like Al Gore's movie was based on a model. Um, a lot of climate data is based on a model. And are models true? They can be, or they can be false, right? But we generally as a public don't understand science, sometimes they use models and sometimes they use actual scientific data, right? Data is data's a part of it, but models are also a part of it. And anything that looks at, let's use climate change as a big example, right? Because they're looking at climate change saying, oh, the world the world's going to end if we don't do X. Okay. That's one side of it, right? The other side of it is, what are we sacrificing to get that thing? And is that sacrifice worth it, right? So if there's a 5% chance that the world's going to end because we're, we're, we're polluting it or, you know, whatever, I'm not going to get out of it, but let's say there's a 5% chance and we have to sacrifice 90% of global GDP for 10 years in order to accommodate that, is it worth it? And I'm not saying it is or isn't. I'm just saying you have to look at the numbers and say, is it worth it? Is it worth killing 90% of the planet to save the planet? I don't know. Like, I mean, this isn't a decision I make. It's like going to war. Like, yeah, you got people fighting and uh, you got Palestine and Israel fighting or Hamas more accurately and Israel fighting. And is, is war worth it? I, and people would say, no, it's not worth it. But, you know, if you if you kind of remove the emotional element, then there are some justifications you can make on either side. Right. I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm just saying, like, you can always come up with a reason why it makes sense. Right. Because, well, if somebody attacks me and I don't fight back, they're going to kill everybody in my country. That's a justification. Right. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's a justification. You can always come up with justifications for the worst atrocities man has ever had. Somebody will always come up with a justification. Doesn't mean it's right. 
So when you're thinking about um, when you're thinking about models, right? And and this this kind of brings it back is um, this example uh, of diversification was designed uh, to illustrate a point, and Wall Street used it to sell more stuff, and they do this frequently. So diversification is a volatility management tool. Volatility means the ups and downs and the price movements every day. A risk management tool means 2008, uh, early 2000s, 2020. Uh, I feel like we've got a lot of those recently, 1987. Those are risk management. So if you didn't lose big money during those times, you had good risk management. If you did lose big money, you had volatility management. What about last year? How did everybody do? Well, virtually everything lost money last year with, with a handful of exceptions. Well, that wasn't really risk management. So it was designed. So if you had a 60, 40 portfolio, right? 60% stocks, 40% bonds. Uh, you'd say, oh, I was protected from the vol from the risk is how people would describe it. Most advisors call it risk. It's not risk. So the way that portfolio is designed is the stocks go up, bonds go down, vice versa. It just it narrows the band of volatility, right? The ups and downs. So it just shrinks it. So it's, it's an easier ride. However, when they both go down a lot, you don't have volatility management. You have risk management because everything went down, which means if you lost 15 to 30 percent last year, then you didn't have risk management. You had volatility management. And so just understanding the difference between the two is really important because if you don't know the difference, then you could have another 2008 where you lose 50 to 60 percent of your stuff and you wake up and be like, huh, my diversification didn't work. Yeah, no, no crap. Right. No shit. I don't want to swear on the show. But anyway, so just <laughs> not that I don't want to swear on the show, but I know some countries actually, if I swear, then I get banned. So I don't that's that's the reason I don't care about swearing. But uh, just just letting you know, <laughs> that's why I try to keep it clean. Um, did you anyway, say some I, countries? Where are we broadcasting? <laughs> uh, I think we're in like a hundred and some odd countries, Doug. We're um, excellent. I have to look this up. We're actually in a lot of countries. Yeah, I'm going to start marketing that I'm world famous. I mean, <laughs> or world infamous. Which one? It, I also infamous. I also want to say dad joke of the day here, Kirk. I know you're talking about the effectiveness of modeling, you know, and models selling mutual funds. Listen, models have always sold everything. Just ask L Brands. They built their entire brand off of it. So, you know, models work. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. But That's boom. Of the day. Yeah. Um, uh, all right. So I, I do want to point out a few things and I hand it back to Doug. There's a few charts I saw here, which I thought were interesting. Um, so one of them is, this is, uh, I can't can prove this. No, oh well. Okay, well, this is the best I can do. So small companies now face rates at 10%. Now, this is one of the factors of why we could go, we, I'll say could in, in air quotes, because it's probably close to will, go into recession um, in the near future. Because big companies are not beholden to the same standards. Big companies, AAA, AA, as you note, as I mentioned earlier, they're on 5% interest rates, maybe even less, which is pretty good, right? If Apple, Microsoft, Google, like, you know, Johnson, Johnson, they can borrow rates at 4%, 5%, that's fine, right? If they're making 10% profits, they can live with that, right? Because they're still going to, they're still going to be profitable. But let's say there's a small company that has 10% profits. Uh, now they have to borrow at 10%, not three or four or five, they're borrowing at 10. Well, now they have no profits. The rate of interest ate up their entire profits. Well, that's that might be okay for a year or two, but what happens if that lasts for ten years? What happens if we go into recession and their revenues shrink? What if? What if? What if? So the challenge with a lot of this stuff is the fact that um, if you look at small companies now, they're at a place where uh, interest rates are close to where they were in the early, uh, early in the mid to late uh, aughts, and they were even higher before that. And all that means is small companies are going to have a tougher time. But what that also means is that they've been living off cheap, easy money. A lot of companies are going to go bankrupt. And because they eventually have to pay the piper, which is the same problem the U.S. government has. Hmm. So the U.S. government has been living off of cheap, easy money for a long time. And now the concern is, is that, hey, now we're going to refinance our debt at higher rates. Can we afford it to pay it? 
and I can't remember if it's 30 or 40 percent of our our uh, government revenue is uh, goes to interest. I, I think it's 30 percent, but it might be 40 um, of our of our national uh, basically our our budget, our annual budget in this country goes to paying interest. So what happens if that doubles or triples? Well, now we're in trouble. Now that's not going to happen tomorrow, right? They're, all of a sudden the bonds aren't coming due tomorrow, and they're gonna they're gonna go up. But every year some comes due, and we reissue new bonds. And the and the and the I think the Treasury came out this week and said that they're going to not issue long bonds, which frankly is what should have happened years ago when it was three percent. You should have issued thirty year Treasuries at three percent. And that's all you should have done years ago. And so we didn't have to worry about this for 30 years. Now we don't have a problem. However, now we do. So what the government's decided to do in their infinite wisdom is let's um, let's borrow in the short end of the curve where it's the highest. Let's go for the highest end. Now, unless they know something, which they might, um, which is, well, if we go into a massive recession and they drop rates to zero again, then they can play this game all over again. But is that going to happen? I don't know. That's an open question in my mind. If we go into a massive recession, will the government bail us out? Or will they keep rates high because they're afraid of inflation? So what happened in the 70s, for those of you historians will follow along with me, what happened in the 70s was exactly what's going on now, which is we had inflation, raised rates, we thought we beat it, and then we lowered rates. And then what happened? Inflation spiked up again. Because we went into a recession, we, we raised rates, and inflation picked up. We hit stagflation. And then it took Volcker to really kill off inflation. And Paul is no dummy. Well, he might be, but he's no dummy because he, he's read history. He knows exactly what, what happened, and he doesn't want to repeat it. That is very clear from his testimony. He does not want to repeat the 70s. So I don't think he's going to lower rates all that quickly. But that brings in another problem. Because if you don't lower rates... Then we become Japan. Japan was mired in deflation for 30 years, and they're still having problems. So which is worse, where we are or Japan? I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. And honestly, I don't know if anybody does. It's a, it's a, it's a foggy guess what the answer to that is. My guess is it's probably better to do what we've been doing than to do what Japan's doing, because Japan is just a rocket ship ride into, you know, I want to call it hyperinflation, but let's just say currency problems and leave it at that. I don't want to start a bank run. Speaking of bank runs, Doug, uh, what do we have to talk about with banks? Because banks are, uh, I think they're up the creek without a paddle. I think that's the, the term. Maybe that's the technical term. Well, what are your, what are your I don't thoughts know. On banks? In the, you know, to quote Yogi, Yogi Berra, this is deja vu all over again, because <laughs> I do believe that this is something that we were talking heavily about last year. Uh, what 18 months ago, when the the when we with the Silicon Valley Bank crisis and a number of other banks uh, have uh, were were running into a cash flow crunch, and you just started talking today about what happens if all of a sudden people can get better money on their cash, they're going to start pulling out of the stock market, but they're also going to start pulling it out of the banks. Okay, and when they start to pull it out of the banks, then the banks have a limited amount of money that they have in reserves. What, where in many cases, these banks kept a lower amount of reserves uh, based off of uh, some changes that were allowed to them in 2020 with COVID. Um, and again, they put these reserve requirements in place after 2008 in order to prevent issues of run-ons and lack of liquidity. And then they took them away and it's what, less than two, less than two years later, we had a lack of liquidity. So what happened with this? Banks went out and they like to invest money in order to be able to give you a cash yield on your accounts. And banks are in the business of giving you a lot less money than they take in. Would you agree with that, Kirk? <laughs> that's the goal. Pretty good, that's <laughs> a goal. It's a pretty good business model to do that. Well, here's the thing. You can see that the unrealized interest in banks is what this is, is that what banks went out and did is they like to invest their money in, like we talked about, technically safe assets. And those technically safe assets have often predominantly been U.S. Treasury. Well, guess what? U.S. Treasury, you know, when it was 30 year, when it was the 30 year, and it was long term and it was paying 5% and they could pay you 0.5%. And you'd if, at, if you were at a really good bank, you're getting 0.5%. And you were happy about that because there was really no place to turn. 
Well, there's lots of places to turn now. New issued interest on new issued bonds is basically in the four, five, six percent range. And the federal government told us this was coming. Uh, J J Jerome Powell said it was coming. Ironically, we talked about this on a previous show that Silicon Valley Bank CEO or president was sitting on the board of the Federal Reserve, of the Tre US, uh, Federal Reserve and knew that this was coming. And yet they went and doubled down on buying long-term treasuries. Here's the problem. Now people want more yield. Now people can get more yield and they're not going to be happy with three and a half percent interest rates. And so what's happening is these 30 year bonds that these banks have sitting on are basically now underwater. They've lost a tremendous amount of value because nobody wants them. It's not just a problem where it was 24 months ago, where if they sell them, they might sell them at a loss. We've gotten to the point where it's possible that they might not even be able to sell them at all. Okay. So now if we've talked about, you know, fixed income is mathematically able to be calculated as to what the val true value is, uh, the yield to maturity based on where the market is and other interest rates out there. And as you can see here, look at these banks. They kind of all balanced around held to maturity, available for sale, and they bounced around a little bit above par, a little bit below par for probably what looks to be around 20, 22 years. Look what's happened just in the past year or two, okay? As the federal government to fight inflation, the Federal Reserve, to be more specific, jacked up interest rates. The value of the assets that these banks hold on to plummeted. Held to maturity, way negative. Available for sale, incredibly negative. Okay. It means that these banks are basically sitting on assets they cannot easily liquidate without taking down the entire financial health of the bank or they might not be able to liquidate them at all. So if you're trying to go out there and get your cash out of the bank, probably not a problem. If everybody goes and tries to kick their cash out of the bank, the bank is going to have to turn somewhere to create that liquidity because of the Federal Reserve uh, reserve requirements. And guess what? They may not be able to raise it quickly. And that's what we call a bank failure. Now, what happened with Silicon Valley Bank is a couple things got put into place that may have eased that burden. So now not only can the federal government just borrow infinitely, they'll, instead of just having FDIC or SIPC rules out there to protect you in the event of a bank failure, the federal government, the Federal Reserve did get together to basically allow for a lending to these banks to create liquidity. So it has tempered down some of the immediate liquidity issues of these banks. Again, we've talked about that previously, about 12, you know, 12 to 18 months ago. But the problem hasn't gone away. As a matter of fact, it is it has gotten worse because as you know, there's other charts out there and other data out there showing that China is selling U.S. Treasuries, Japan is selling U.S. Treasuries. They're one of the biggest holders of it. So everybody, guess what happens, Kirk? If everybody's out there selling and very few people are buying, how likely does that make it for you to be able to sell what you're selling? Very difficult. Right, it's a huge supply, low demand issue, and a huge supply to low demand issue. Simple economics, massive losses, and um, you know. And right now, I know there's been articles about U.S. Bank, uh, you know, coming out having massive unrealized loss losses right here in my neck of the woods in the Minneapolis area. Bank of America is sitting on maybe 150 billion dollars in estimated losses. Listen. If you have, and, and I've, I've, we've got a client right now, we've got several clients right now that we've worked with who have been trying to get money out of their banks. And they've got a lot of their money with these banks because a lot of these banks would throw promos. You know, you get a higher interest rate if you move everything with us. You know, again, I am not going to sit there and say it's a causation correlation, but it has been more difficult in the last 12 to 18 months to get certain Asset for clients to get certain assets, whether it's cash or other holdings out of these banks. Is it, is it because of ineptitude? Not sure. It could be. It could be because they are egregiously trying to hold on to that because they don't have the liquidity to get rid to, to be able to let go of that. And mm -hmm. it could be a combination of both. But what I'm saying to anybody that's listening is don't run out there and just, you know, go on a run on the banks. Don't beg for all your money out right now. But I would be very, I'd start, I'd be realize that yes, these banks now have another 
vehicle that they can go to that's been set up for liquidity. So you can get your money out, but understand that it's not just the, it's not the big banks. It's not the regional banks. It's all banks right now are sitting on an extremely volatile portfolio of assets that is putting them in the position of one of the, of the, one of the greatest banking crises that we could ever see. And we've even, even in the, in the liquidity and credit crisis, 2008, you did not, you saw liquidity issues when the reserve money market, money market broke, you certainly saw over leveraging, but we did not see the level of unrealized losses, the absolute decline of value. And what do we talk about early in the show? The permanent loss of capital that we are seeing with these banking institutions right now. And there's a number of people who are at fault for it. Yeah, I mean, you raise a, you raise a good point, Doug, and you mentioned a few bank names. Um, I, I had actually heard from uh, a friend about research on, on Bank of America as well. I won't get into the details. I'm not uh, allowed to say, but just uh, I think just looking at the financials, you can probably tell yourself it's nothing secret or inside. It's just, um, you know, looking at the potential losses they have. Look, I, I you mentioned uh, I'll tell you some anecdotal stuff, and I don't want to cause a bank run because I don't know anything. But anecdotally, I remember back in um, 2010, maybe it was. I used Bank of America, and I'd walk in and just um, I remember walking in and asking for some money, and the guy behind me was asking for like ten thousand dollars because he's going on a trip, and he even, he was explaining it to them. He's like, "I'm going on a trip. I need the cash." We're like, well, we don't have the cash. What do you mean you don't have the cash? Like you don't have ten thousand dollars? The hell! It's like, well, we don't have that kind of cash, and that kind of scared me. And you know, I was thinking, oh, there must be a bank run. They don't have the cash. But the reality is, is that everything's electronic nowadays. What they didn't have was the actual cash, not that they don't have the ability to give it to them. They didn't have the physical cash, and there's a difference, right? Because most of the most of the business is done electronically. So, but I do want to point out the a point that Doug said is that if we have a banking crisis again, and I would say there's an extremely high probability of that happening. And it's not because of what happened in 2008. And I wanna be clear, because what happened in 2008 was a disaster for the financial system and they deserved it, frankly, because of the way they ran their business. Um, but they, um, and I don't think enough people lost money, their jobs or went to jail because of it, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but that system was broken and they've put in a lot of, uh, other regulatory things to fix that. So I'm not going to say it's not going to happen again, but it's not happening now. So that's not what I'm talking about. What Doug was talking about, which is the potential losses on the books is basically comes down to a bank not doing its job very well. A, a bank has basically... <laughs> It's a simple model. And I know banking's the, the financials are complicated, just like insurance, because finance is, is complicated when you compare that to like a Coca-Cola, which is relatively easy. Um, but if you look at like a bank, basically their job is we're going to borrow money on the short end of the curve and we're going to lend it at the long end of the curve. Now, if a yield curve is normal, right, it's like 2% and 4%. So 2% in the short end, 4% on the long end. You borrow it two and you lend it four, you make a 2% spread and you go to the golf course by three o'clock. Like that's basically the banking model, right? Now, what happened in the last few years is because these banks were not making enough money on their portfolio, they went out to the long end of the curve. They're like, well, let's, let's, you know, let's, let's, um, let's go for the 30 year instead of the, the, the quick one, or even if they did the quick, it doesn't matter because there's still losses. The reality is, is if banks, have their portfolio tied up in long-term treasuries, right? As an example, they can't sell because they'll lose money. Now they could have sold a year and a half ago. Like basically they could have sold in 2021. If they sold then they would have been perfectly fine. And as Doug said, they already knew this. I knew this, Doug knew this. You probably know this, you listeners know this because everyone talked about it for <laughs> over six months. Hey, we're gonna start raising rates soon. I mean, the Fed telegraphed this, like, I don't want to say it was like six to 12 months in advance. It was not a secret. Everyone knew in January they were going to start raising rates. And so it wasn't insiders that knew this. Everyone knew it. And yet they still didn't change their portfolio. Why? I have no effing idea. I, 
absolutely Kirk, no it's idea. like it's like sitting on the board of directors of Coca-Cola and then being blindsided when new Coke failed and saying we didn't realize that uh, we were going to switch cork, Coke formulas. You're on the board of directors. How do you not see that coming? You're you're the ones making this decision. Right. And yet you're going out there and surprised by the result. It's mind it's, blowing. It, it's 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 shocking to me that these people still have jobs. I hope they don't. But people are that that ridiculous. Uh, they shouldn't have jobs because and it, and it, and it's not just one person. It's literally the whole industry. But the, the the point is is this is a foreseeable problem that wasn't fixed and whatever happened, it happened and it's water under the bridge. But now they have these these losses on their portfolio, which inevitably aren't a problem unless people start withdrawing their cash from the bank, which, hmm, what's going to cause it? Oh, maybe a recession, Doug. I can't pay my bills. I need to pull money out of the bank. Hmm. People Never are going to start withdrawing money from the system, from the banks, and these banks aren't going to have the same amount of money they, they had before, and they're going to have to start selling and realizing losses. So all it's going to take is one big recession and the banks are going to go into another banking crisis. And you heard it. I don't know if you heard it here first, but you definitely heard it here earlier than, than it happened. We're probably very, very, very high probability we're going to have a banking crisis. And it's not going to be because of real estate. So all these you say, well, real estate's fine. It's not having to do with the real estate. All the real estate is part of it because commercial real estate is a, uh, what do they call it? A dumpster fire, a flaming dumpster fire right now. And banks who own that, and there are some banks that have a large exposure to this, they are in trouble because of that real estate. Not residential. Residential at the moment seems to be fine. I don't I don't see any any shenanigans. Commercial side, I think people were doing a lot of commercial lending are in trouble. But um, but that being said, um, I want to kind of kick into one more category before we before we kick it off. I did want to share this one chart because I was talking about it earlier, which is the CPI inflation for the 70s versus today. Um, I'm only bringing this up not because it's so similar, but because this is an example of correlation versus causation. Hey, look, one chart on top of another. What does this mean? Oh, does this mean we're going to have really high inflation just like we did in the 70s? Absolutely not. It does not mean that. And I'm only showing this to poke fun at the fact that people put these things together to illustrate a point of, hey, I know the future because it's going to follow this chart. Maybe it does. I don't know. But I know this chart is not going to be the cause of rates and CPI going back up. It's going to be because of human behavior and human behavior does tend to repeat itself. But like I said earlier, Powell, he's not a dummy. He knows he knows about this and he's probably not going to repeat the same errors. He might. I want to be clear. I don't know. I caveat this. I don't know the future. But I will say that if you're looking at this chart and you're deducing that all of a sudden it's going to be the same, don't. Just ignore the chart. But it is interesting because I think this is similar to what we're thinking in that the first inflation happens. You have human behavior for a few years in there that kind of messes around. And eventually they have to lower rates and eventually inflation kicks back up and we have the late 70s. So I do want to imprint on all of you that we are going to have higher inflation for longer than we think. This is not the early 2000s, not the 2010s. This is a totally different paradigm. I don't know how it's going to look, but I know that mass confusion is mass confusion for a reason because the old paradigm changes a new paradigm and no one knows that it was changed. To me, it was very obvious. Hey, we went from 0% up to 5%. New paradigm, brand new paradigm for most people. So keep that in mind that with your investing, if you're making assumptions based on old assumptions, you're probably gonna get yourself into trouble. Um, I'm gonna let you, uh, there's a story here. I don't know if you wanna talk about it, Doug, but uh, I'll let you kind of take us home here. Which story are you referring to, Kirk? Uh, the uh, the settlement, or you want to talk about something? Oh, else? yeah, yeah. The, okay, thank you. I yeah, just want to make sure we're going on. So the, the, earlier this week, um, there was a massive uh, settlement. Uh, actually, it wasn't even a settlement. It was a jury award, about $1.8 billion that was levied um, That was levied against a number of, I forget exactly which, uh, which broker uh, this was levied against. It was basically attack on the Realtors Association. Um, a lot came, a lot of coming out. It's been, it was kind of silent in the background. There's been a number of lawsuits that have been settled by Keller Williams and another a, a number of other major players in the real estate industry. Most people are, are kind of accustomed to how the real estate industry works. You, you list a house, uh, for the most part, uh, you're going to have, you know, an automatic, it's just going to kind of default to 6% is going to be the seller, you know, the, the, the fee to the seller. 
Um, and then when you sell your house, that comes out the top. The title company takes that money, you know, a part of the sale and gives it to the realtors, and that's how they get paid. Well, what occurred in the in this situation is that the um, is that uh, when this occurs, most people don't know exactly how this all occurs, but once that money's given, the title company will then split and they'll pay usually about three percent of it to the to the seller's broker and they'll put three percent to the buyer's broker, and that's how. And so they walk away, and then the realtor gets paid from there. Well, a uh, the plaintiff was both a seller's broker agency along with a seller who had looked at the transaction of their sale and said, look, all my equity got eaten up in these fees. And now I recognize that I've got someone representing me to sell the house, but why am I paying for the buyer to come to my house? And this is just by the way industry has been forever, right? And again, it all goes through uh, the Realtor Association that kind of sets a lot of these mandates. So what happened is, is this $1.8 billion award effectively said, sorry, yeah, you, you cannot, you know, it, it's inappropriate, we feel, the jury, that you're taking this money and paying them to come buy from you. And that they basically opened up the argument of antitrust. And now the U.S. government has come out and they're, they've opened up some antitrust investigations on this. And, and let's face it, there's one entity that sets all this. So there's certainly some arguments that it is basically under you know, trust or, uh, you know, monopoly type of engagement. Now, whether or not that's in your best interest or not is the big question. Here's the rollout of this and, and it remains to be seen. But under this argument, they both were saying, why should we pay the, why, why should we pay the buyer? Now, buyers have effectively been able to come to the table for free. Now, I know there's a minimal number of clothing costs. Sure, you have to pay for the inspection and stuff like that. But buyers have been able to come to the table and not really have to come up with anything to get representation. That's been presented or always paid by the seller. What's now going to, you're going to start happening. We started to hear some rumblings of brokerage that said, we're no longer going to pay the buyer, the buyer's representation broker in, you know, in these fees. And the court and the jury basically came out in this class action settlement said, and they shouldn't have to. Don't know where this is going to head, but head, but I, here's a couple thoughts that I have on this. Number, number one, buyers now may be in the position where they're going to have to pay for representation on a buyer's broker directly. And, and of course that may drive more brokers out from representing buyers because now you got to get paid up front. And a lot of buyers, one of the things that was nice about real estate is it didn't require a lot of people to come up with a tremendous amount of cash. What cash you needed, whether it was closing costs, title fees, et cetera, you know, on the buyer side, you could roll into your mortgage. And a lot of people, again, they go into the buying situation and they are cash tight. And we already know it's gotten worse now that we've seen an increase in the number of, uh, you know, in the, in the price of homes and interest rates. And so they've rolled a lot of costs into the back end of the mortgage. The law has never allowed those closing costs to be rolled into the back of the mortgage. So if the law doesn't change, now you need to come and pay up front potentially to be represented as a buyer. Again, where that leads is the big question mark, right? I'm not making a prediction, but it puts more pressure on an already uh, reeling industry right now that is struggling with high cost and high interest rates, a lack of a lack of buyers, a lack of product that's out there to be sold. And now there's going to be, they're going to see additional lawsuits and there already was a bunch of them that are attacking the Realtor Association. So just know that it looks like there could potentially be significant changes to come within how real estate transactions occur in an industry that is already struggling with a lot of challenges right now. Yeah, well, I think we're gonna we're gonna definitely keep keep down that path. It's very interesting. Uh, where can people find more about you, Doug? We got to wrap it up. No problem. It, it, thanks. Um, listen, we talk to families every day. I just went on a tour to college. And nobody's asking questions. I talk to families every day. They're like, hey, my kid's going to go here. I just found out someone the other day whose daughter just decided to sign on the bottom line to go to a school um, for what's called early decision. If you don't know what that means, that's question number one you need to figure out. Basically, it is a financial commitment that if they get accepted, you're going to pay it. Well, they just found out that they may be paying $200,000 and they can only afford half that. Listen, paying for college is a real issue for families. Getting, you know, making sure that that child is, it gets to a college where they're going to finish in four years is a real issue for families. Making sure they get a job that gets, you know, out of college is a real issue for families. The struggle of being a senior in high school and dealing with 
all of the th stuff that comes in for paying, you know, to, to pick a college is a real stressor for families. It doesn't have to be this way. You don't have to have as much, you don't have to be, go into debt. You don't have to be broke. You don't have to be as stressed. If you, you feel any of these things, start by getting some information on this. Getting better information is going to help you to be armed. We have a lot of resources at ProCollegePlanners.com or reach out to us at info at ProCollegePlanners.com. Listen, if you're in our age group, college is, whether you want to admit it or not, you know you're stressed about college. Make your life easier and don't go into debt doing it. Great. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for joining us. I want to touch on one thing. We're going to wrap it up here. Uh, and that one thing is this. This is the FedWatch tool meeting probabilities. And this is from earlier this week. And I pointed out because apparently for this meeting this week, virtually nobody, meaning only 5%, uh, nobody thought that the rates would go up. 5% uh, of the people thought they might go down, uh, but 95% thought they would keep it the same. And that's exactly what they did. Next month, however, uh, is, well, in December, I should say. In December, it's a little different. We actually have a much more dispersed crowd. Some people think it's going to rise. Uh, some people keep it the same. I have no idea where it's going to be, but I do find it interesting that over the next year, people think that rates are going to drop at least uh, 100 basis points. Um, it's still not clear, but it's very interesting to me. Um, this is always a tool to keep a watch because it gives you an idea of where the market thinks things are going. And the Fed tends to follow the market. And if they don't, they tend to bump the market in the direction that they want them. So it, it doesn't cause too much ruckus. So like they wouldn't raise rates yesterday because no one thought they would. Uh, I think that's a smart move in their part, because if they did, you would have seen chaos in the markets and they don't want chaos. They want orderly conduct uh, in trading. So anyway, I thought I would share that. I always enjoy those charts when I see them. Um, but yeah, so we're going to we're going to wrap it up. I think that next week we're going to talk about some interesting stuff too. Uh, the, the, the Fed, uh, the Fed spoke this week and the market listened and the market has bounced uh, since then. Uh, I'm not sure what it means. We'll, we'll find out. It, it, the market was oversold and then it bounced uh, after the Fed meeting, which to me just meant that it was ready to go anyway. And it was just needed a catalyst. And that was a catalyst. So we'll see if next week uh, turns in anything. But technically, the market's still uh, still at a, at a point where you could argue that, well, maybe maybe now's a good time to not buy, uh, uh, technically we'll see. Um, we still do have the next two months of the year or three months, which tend to be very strong months. So we could see a significant bounce here, but if we did, I that would just be a great reason to get short in the market. Uh, I think a lot of people, uh, smart people are pretty scared where the market is right now. So, um, doesn't mean it can't go higher, though. Just want to impress upon people that, you know, the market's direction has nothing to do with fundamentals. It has to do with human emotion and psychology and group dynamics. So, um, but anyway, Kirk, we're Kirk, wrapping up I want up to jump here. in on a disclaimer on that. You said, good, you know, get short in the market. We're not telling everybody to go out and short the market. Just no. to be very, very clear, just make sure that you've got risk protection. You're, you're aware of the risk and that you're doing smart things about that earlier than maybe later. Thank, thank you for the disclaimer, Doug. I, I, I was assuming my listeners are really, really smart. So, but thank you for the disclaimer. Most for, of them uh, are, but you never know. One might slip in there. Yeah. CYA, Doug. Thank you. <laughs> That's the show for this week. Thank you again for joining us in Money Tree Investing Podcast. My name is Kirk Chisholm, Wealth Manager of Innovative Advisor Group. We don't just manage your wealth, we make your life better. You can find more about me at innovativewealth.com. And of course, you can find me every week here on this show. You can also check out our show at Money Tree Investing Podcast. On our website, you'll have access to the show notes, resources, and the archive shows. Please remember to subscribe on our YouTube channel for immediate access to the new shows when they're released. When you subscribe to the show, it allows us to get access to some of the top minds of investing in personal finance. While you're here, please leave a comment and question if you want us to address it on the show. Have a great week ahead. And remember, no one will care about your money like you do. So invest in your life.